welcome again to The Way It Is. I'm Luke Andalfato with Remax Service First Realty, your host. And uh, I was just reminding, this is podcast 14. Hard to believe. Uh, had I known that last last week's was 13, I would have made a special comment about the baker's dozen. But uh, anyway, um, I hope you're enjoying them. Uh, I'm starting to get the groove, I think, and uh, actually starting to enjoy doing these things. So today we are going to talk about residential tenancies. Dum, da, dum, dum. So if you're a landlord, uh, currently want to be a landlord, thinking about being a landlord, no friends or people that are landlords, um, some things you need to know. If you're a tenant uh, looking to rent uh, or renting now, there's things you need to know too. So um, the residential tenancies in Ontario is essentially controlled by uh, or regulated by the Residential Tenancies Act. And you can go online and you can find all the details there, scripture and verse, and it's a long, lengthy document. Um, there are some sites that give you the highlights. Um, the, the things basically that you need to know, um, uh, and especially, you know, the pandemic, has changed, not that it's changed the rules, the rules are still there. It's just made them very difficult to implement uh, and to manage now. Um, the, um, the governing body that adjudicates all uh, residential tenancy disputes is called the Landlord uh, Tribunal. Um, and so there, if, uh, if a landlord, uh, you know, obviously wants to try to evict a tenant or has an issue with a tenant or a tenant has an issue with a landlord, you have to file required paperwork, or the right paperwork, submit it to uh, the tribunal, um, and then await time for a hearing. So back in the day, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, there used to be six adjudicators for the Kingston region, um, pre-pandemic, and then they chopped that to four. Uh, and now during the pandemic, uh, and so that was creating, sorry, I'll back up a bit. That was creating a backlog for uh, cases and hearings. And now with the pandemic, it is just, it's past backlog. Uh, the earliest, I think someone would get a hearing if you filed the paperwork, the proper paperwork today would be Best case scenario, eight months, but more like 12 to 14 to 15 months, maybe even longer. So it's become a bit of the Wild West out there for residential tenancies. I hate to put it that way, um, but, you know, COVID and then these um, stay-at-home orders and lockdowns and then Doug Ford basically verbalizing that everybody gets a pass and that there can't be any evictions um, really threw everything into, into chaos. Um, unfortunately, um, I operate a property management company alongside my real estate business, Proactive Property Management, shameless advertising in the back here. Um, and um, we were fortunate, touch wood, that we only had one uh, last year, one set of tenants out of all the buildings we manage um, take advantage of the COVID scenario. Uh, we knew they were collecting CERB. We knew uh, and we even went to them and tried to work with them. They actually signed a promissory note, but in the end, basically just took off and didn't pay, didn't pay rent because they knew they could not pay rent and get away with it. So you hate to say it and you hate to see it, uh, but in this world, sadly, there's those that uh, don't have any scruples or integrity and uh, and will behave that way. Uh, and the same goes for landlords. I'm not trying to paint all tenants with a bad brush. There's landlords that don't behave well uh, and behave poorly and treat tenants poorly. And, um, and th we don't have any of those in our portfolio, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that, um, because it just makes our job that much harder to manage these things uh, because we become... Uh, referee and uh, the last thing we want to do is is be referees to be candid with you um, the goal today uh, in in operating a rental property uh, during the pandemic truthfully is to try to have the best most open transparent communication and relationship you can have with your tenant if they're struggling which some are then you got to work with them 
if uh, if they're being um, if they're doing things that contravene the act and and that are actually uh, grounds for eviction, then you've got to do your due diligence, file your paperwork. But at the end of the day, the reality is you got to find means to cut a deal with them. Uh, and we've recommended that and we've done it. The lawyer I had on several podcasts ago even commented that trying to sell a property with tenants in it today is challenging. In fact, the best thing is to try to have it empty before you sell it. Because trying to get rid of a tenant in today's world is 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 difficult at the best of times. Um the really two main reasons to even evict a tenant are non-payment of rent and if you physically want to occupy the unit again for your own purposes. And that has to be yourself or a direct family member, not your third cousin twice removed from uh, a country you haven't been to before or anything like that. So you have to, it has to be a direct family member, brother, sister, mother, father, uh, sibling, uh, so my brother, sister, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I repeated myself there. Um, but yes, um, otherwise you have to cut a deal with them. You have to approach them and just say, listen, this isn't working out. What's it going to take? And and uh, try to do what you can do. Otherwise, you are going to be waiting. Um, now we have uh, some questions. Uh, we're going to do a QA. and a My uh, my videographer, podcast uh, chap hidden in the background there, Ben Myers, is uh, did up some questions. So uh, Ben, I'll say hello and thank you for doing that. And I'll let you go ahead and ask some questions. Oh, so. yeah. Thank, thanks for having me on. Uh, absolutely. You know, I was reading the uh, Residential Tenancies Act earlier today and, you know, just kind of was writing down my ideas and thoughts because, again, I'm coming from a place where, you know, in terms of my rental capacity, it was always, you know, short term, medium term rentals for, you know, university and such. So, you know, it's, it's definitely interesting to see what actual rights I had versus what people did sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess kind of going right in, um, one of the first things that the uh, RTA there uh, states is that it uh, doesn't apply to tenants who must share a kitchen or bathroom with the landlord. Um, in those kinds of situations, um, this is, I'm sure, a very helpful one because this was a big case when I went, um, uh, you know, rental shopping when I was in Ottawa. Um, a lot of places they would have the landlord living in a bottom of a of a, of a house, mm -hmm. and then they would have like a, a bathroom and kitchenette dedicated to the upstairs. Does that qualify, even though you are technically living with the landlord? Yeah. So. Uh... I would say no. And the reason being that it's still classified as what we call shared accommodation, right? So you're still sharing the home with, um, with the owner. And as such, um, yeah, the, 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 the normal tenancy rules do not apply where you would have what would trigger that to kick in is you would actually have to have a self-contained unit within that building. So, and we see a lot of it where there's a lot of basement units in the city of Kingston, uh, legal and illegal ones. Um, I can tell you there's more illegal units in the city of Kingston than there are legal ones. And if there's any members from the city of Kingston listening to this, they know it as well. Uh, that being said, you know, it's a complaint driven process. Um, and so that's why you have to be very careful in terms of the tenants that you choose, um, you know, the neighbors that you have, uh, all that kind of thing. But when it's shared space in the same home and, and a kitchenette, you know, th that can mean a lot of different things. A lot of times it's just a hot plate. A hot plate doesn't constitute um, a stove. And that was actually um, for in a, in a separate unit that was actually a determining factor that qualified that unit as as separate in and of itself was the existence of a, a stove plugged into the wall and actually conduit going from the panel to the stove. Uh, so a lot of landlords, if they had to, if their their units weren't legal, they were forced to take the stove out and actually had to remove the conduit right back to the panel and disconnect it. So once there's no stove, then there's no unit, technically. Wow. Yeah, I guess uh, 
you know, <laughs> cooking is definitely valuable in those situations. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, again, if you're going to do shared accommodation, my recommendation would be to do it the right way, which is share the kitchen and then they know, you know, what appliances they're using and they're not plugging in something that you don't want them plugging in or leaving it on when they shouldn't leave it on and all the rest of it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I mean, moving right on, we have uh, one of the other major things that kind of it covers in the RTA is rent increases. You know, it's, it's just a matter of fact that, you know, as time goes on, as the economy changes, rent does increase, especially as like things are added on. Um, but in instances where the tenant feels that the rent increase might be seen as unfair, such as let's say it, the, they presume that the rent is being increased specifically to out, out them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're trying to push out an old tenant. Yeah. Uh, can they contest that with the, um, the LTV, the Landlord and Tenant Board. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, anything can be contested for sure. Whether you have grounds for a case or not to win to, to win your hearing is is another matter. But I mean, rent increases are 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 in the Residential Tenancies Act. There's a guideline every year. Um, the uh, the Landlord and Tenant Board passes the legal allowable uh, rental increase guideline. It's been very nominal over the last decade, like less than 2%. Um, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is yet for 2021. I'd have to look it up. But I think last year was like 1.8, something like that, 1.9. So it's not, we're not talking massive increases where you get, and that has to be, again, done uh, properly with the right paperwork. And that's where if you're a landlord, be very careful, get someone to review the paperwork that knows what they're doing. Because if you serve the wrong document or serve the right document incorrectly, meaning if it's not filled out correctly, it gets tossed out like it has no, it's void. So it's very, very, very important. I can't stress it enough that when you're completing documents, make sure you're you you they're done right and you know what there is a 1-800 number and they're very helpful when you call to help you fill them out and i'm sure online there's examples in fact when you go to the landlord um, tribunal site there uh they board site rather they uh, they have uh examples of how to fill it out correctly and i i encourage anybody tenant or landlord to avail themselves of that where you get so if the if a landlord just unilaterally said hey this is under rent that I'm going to increase the rent to X without doing the proper steps because you can actually recapture increases if they haven't been taken in a prolonged period of time. However, there's a certain notice period, a minimum 90 days, I believe. Uh, I have to just double check that. Could be 120. I think it's 90 for sure. And then the landlord has to make the application, serve it to the tenant uh, with the right amount of time to say, hey, listen, I'm going to try to recapture the increases that haven't been taken uh, over the last three years or four years or whatever. And so then you can actually try to increase your rent by a sum. For those that just simply say, I'm trying to increase it because I want to get rid of somebody. Well, that's, you take you take that with its own risks and its own challenges for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I, that's obviously why this whole, you know, tenancies act was installed, right. It's just to make sure that both people, both sides know that they have rights in these situations and that nobody's taking advantage of each other. That's right. Yeah. And, and I'll just, as a quick aside, I mean, the, one of the, Truthfully, one of the best things that happened, I think in my opinion, others would argue with me, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some landlords pulling their hair out right now, but is that uh, in April of 2018, the Landlord Tenant Board standardized uh, a lease agreement for Ontario. Because there was as many probably lease agreements out there and rental agreements as there are landlords and tenants in the plant, you know, in Ontario. So, and everybody... I'm sure thought they were smarter than everybody else and had lawyers draft clauses and terms and everything like that. So they came up with a standardized lease agreement. It's actually very basic. I think it's like one or two pages. Now, and it's really, it's actually very self-explanatory. It's straightforward. So both parties understand it because that's where, you know, and I know I'm guilty of it too. I had a lease agreement that I borrowed from, you know, previous iterations and stuff. And it was a lengthy document. In fact, it was 14 pages. So, but, and it covered 
almost everything from renting a condominium in a, in a building to renting a room in a house, right? In a rooming house. So um, now they've just standardized it, made it one thing. You can add amend, uh, amendments or addendums, I guess, or clauses into the body of the agreement. Both the tenant and the landlord can, but just be aware that if any of those terms contravene the act, they're null and void anyway. So at the end of the day, just... Again, it's about having a good relationship with the tenant going in, being upfront with the terms, being transparent about it. They have to be transparent with you in terms of their qualifications and abilities to rent and abilities to pay rent, you know? Um, sorry, I'm digressing quite a bit, but I just want to make this other point. You know, we get a lot of landlords that say, well, you're going to do a credit check, right? And you're going to do this. Well, we can, we have the ability to do them. We don't normally do them. And I'll tell you why. Well, A, there's a cost involved for sure. And the landlord bears that. But the other thing is this. I've had both experiences where a, a, a tenant with a bad credit report doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad tenant or it doesn't reflect their ability to pay rent on time and pay it consistently and be a great tenant. I've had those experiences. I've also had the experience where the perfect tenant candidate comes along with fantastic qualifications and great credit score and they're one of the most difficult tenants to deal with and then uh, have issues and everything like that so again it, it it's about it, it is a relationship business and it's a people business like just like real estate and uh, uh, even more so because the small things get exposed and and um uh what's the word I'm looking for, but they just get exacerbated even more, you know what I'm saying, than, than yeah. they would in a normal situation. So, so, well, actually, so jumping off that, you know, for all perspective, um, you know, property managers and such out there, people, landlords and such, um, do you have any insight into what kind of questions you want to be asking uh, prospective tenants to kind of get ideas of who they might be as renters? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we have a basic application that we send out. I mean, you have the, the, the normal stuff. Who are you? Uh, where do you live now? Where do you work now? Um, and who's going to be living with you? And I'm going to cross uh, into the pet world uh, because pets, you know, especially during the pandemic, everybody's got one now. And pets are great. Um, my experience, unfortunately, with, I hate to say it, uh, with a lot of tenants, though, is that they get pets for all the wrong reasons. Um, they're selfish about it uh, because they want companionship and then they're just not good pet owners or pet. They don't keep their, they don't attend to their pets. They don't know how to handle their pets. They're just not responsible with pets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, could be and and so our goal is to ensure that the candidate fits the fits into the unit right in terms of space spatially right if it's a one bedroom a two bedroom and all of a sudden you have five people living in it well that's not a fit you know I, you know I, budget aside you can't take four people in a one bedroom apartment I'm sorry it's just not going to work uh, you know I understand people fall on hard times I understand that but that's just not what we're about and not what we do, you know? So um, we check for references, of course. Um, again, you have to put an asterisk beside previous landlord references because I've seen it where landlords just want to pass on tenants and so they'll give them a glowing review. Uh, most of the time though, landlords are pretty candid about their experiences with, with their tenants as we are when we get those calls because we get those calls often too. And we're very, we're just frank. You know, these are our experiences with this tenant uh, or, or if a tenant, this is our experience with this landlord, you know? Um, so you want to get that, you want to get proof of income verification, no different than if you're applying for loans or a mortgage or something like that, right? You, we want to know that there's some credit worthiness there, right? I mean, no, you don't need to make bags and bags of money, but you, you, you need to demonstrate that you have the ability to afford the rent, right? Because otherwise it becomes problematic, right? Um, especially if the rent is plus the utilities, you know, uh, because that's added costs there that have to come into play. It's not just the rent that you have to come up with. And you want to make sure that given their income, they're not living hand to mouth because that's just a recipe for disaster, right? I mean, and I'm not trying to play, uh, teach people how to live or anything like that, but 
you know, if you're strapped every month just to come up with the rent and pay your utilities, well, how are you living then? How are you buying groceries? How are you going doing that? How are you, you know, if you have a pet, how are you taking care? All of those things come into play. So it's, it's a, for us, we take a fairly broad view of, of the tenants, all the tenants' um, experiences and situations, right? Uh, and at the end of the day, I hate to say it, um, I rely on my spidey sense, I call it, because I've done this long enough and I have a pretty good judge of people. Well, so exactly. You have done, been doing this for quite some time. Is there any, um, how do you say, it, secret red flags that you seem to, that you would, could recommend to pick up on? Yeah, there are. Uh, you know, I'd have to almost be with you interviewing a tenant at a property to almost because there's some key phrases I always pick up on. And when people start commenting a certain way or exaggerating certain things or making certain, there's certain comments and things that I pick up on pretty quickly. Um, and you hate to say it um, or hate to, I mean, but, and yet, you know, again, uh, going back to who makes a good tenant, who makes a bad tenant, uh, you know, I, I had tenants show up that you'd look at them and say, wow, that's pretty rough around the edges. And yet they're the best tenant. They pay their rent on time. They treat the place respectfully. They take care of it. And then those that, you know, I mean, there were movies were made about it. I even forget what it was about uh, with the one with Michael Keaton and the crazy tenant or whatever, when they lived in the couldn't, in the place and couldn't get rid of the tenant. Um, I'm dating myself when I say that, but um the uh, you know and those tenants that come across polished and and fantastic and again they're they're the ones that are maybe complaining all the time or or just uh, high expectations and high maintenance you know um, but yes I mean uh, that's why I mean I have a day to day operations manager I I sort of sit back in the wings now and just oversight you know provide oversight and and just knowledge and experience when questions come up and everything and. They're getting better at being uh, picking up the signals, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there certainly are telltale signs for sure. So, so a lot of um, landlords recently have been starting to kind of utilize um, social media tools and marketplaces. Facebook Marketplace um, now even has, you know, for the past couple of years, its own section for rentals, where yeah. you can discover rentals by price and such. Um, you know, one of, one of the big things for ensuring that you do get a rental and like get it properly, you know, accommodated, do you have any recommendations for how oh, people should list um, any tips for, you know, what they should be thinking about, you know, putting in their descriptions? Putting yeah. So, you know, and, and I'll just tell you from our personal experience, we try to provide as much detail as possible because I'll tell you what, it saves time and effort because if you provide vague descriptions and vague information you're going to get inundated with in, uh, inquiries and you're going to pull your you're going to want to poke your eyes out like it's just save yourself a step be as detailed as possible get as many good photos as you can um, post them um, you know facebook marketplace is fantastic now i mean it's it's almost eliminated the need for kijiji because uh, because kijiji was before the largest driver of traffic for anything to buy and sell or rent right oh, uh, that, 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 uh, yeah, well it, it, you know um thankfully my young operations managers now are into that facebook marketplace and they do that but i was old school kijiji all the time and it was frustrating uh, but uh if i was going to make any recommendations as many photos as you can as much detail as you can if it's a two bedroom call it a two bedroom if it's a one bedroom plus a den call it a one bedroom plus a den if it's not a bedroom don't call it a bedroom you know um at, at the end of the day uh you know you you want to ease your process right you want to you want to try to vet people before they even inquire right so that you're streamlining your candidates and by the time you get inquiries, you're getting the best qualified inquiries you can, right? That's yeah. that's the goal. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I figured, you know, when I was making up these uh, this list, uh, I I figured, you know, we might as well add one fun thing in just to keep it not too dry. And I kind of aim upon uh, one of the parts of the RTA that says, within a 24 hours notice, um, a person who's selling that includes real estate agents or property managers. Is allowed to go into the uh, the building. Correct. What's the most bizarre thing you've ever seen in one of these buildings? Well, I've seen some pretty bizarre things. I've seen some things that I probably can't say on the air here. Um, I know I've shown a rental property where we didn't think anybody was home, and then you know 
we went into one of the bedrooms and somebody was home. Uh, in fact, two people were home uh, enjoying themselves. So that uh, that was interesting. Um, and, you know, actually this coincides with a real estate story I did in previous podcast where I talked about, you know, after all these years, some of the crazy things I've seen. Well, I was showing a, a rental property, an investment property, and in one of the units, there was a pen with uh, rats or white mice in the corner. And um, those that listen to that podcast remember this. And I was going, uh, my spidey sense was on fire. I was going, okay, what, why is there, why is someone raising mice in their apartment? And so we didn't see it, but after the fact, it came out that there was a python somewhere in the rafters in that apartment. So thankfully we didn't see it or it didn't, <laughs> didn't come down and strangle or suffocate any of us. But yeah, so um, there are some bizarre things. I've been in some, unfortunately, some units where, you know, a certain socioeconomic demographic, it's not pretty. You see some, you see some people living in some pretty, you know, pretty tough, time, uh, tough, living conditions uh, and that's never fun that's for sure oh absolutely you know that's the, the absolutely the, the not fun part of it yeah um you know we are talking about um still along the lines of covid and um you you mentioned earlier on that evictions are harder to do right now because of covid guidelines now one of the parts on reasons for eviction do include um the i want to exactly quoted it's based off illegal activity or affecting the safety of others yeah um could that be classified under the covid guidelines such as large gatherings or you know improper well sure i mean and i've had that experience where uh you know another one is overcrowding and, and disrupting the quiet enjoyment of any neighboring tenants right so and 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 here's the other thing i mean well i'll let me finish with that, I guess, and then I'll go on to, you know, some some complications that have happened because of how the world's changed. But yeah, you know, uh, illegal activity is, you know, if the guy is dealing drugs, which I've had, you know, uh, and it happens in Kingston, it happens in every municipality. Let's not kid ourselves, right? I mean, even though there's pot is legal now and you can go buy it, there's still uh, illicit you know, drug sales happening everywhere. Um, if someone is, um, I had one where, in, you know, in every residence, a person can operate a home-based business. You can use up to 25% of your living space to operate a home-based business. So that would qualify for a tenant because that's their home, right? In an apartment. But I had a guy running a full-scale sushi takeout place out of a out of a unit like full on with employees and everything else so it's one thing to say it's a home-based business it's another thing to say you've taken over the entire apartment to run a whole full on so he was just trying to take advantage of a cheaper rental structure exactly exactly not paying commercial rents not having the least retail space you know not having to have a commercial kitchen or whatever other uh re guidelines or you know regulations would would flow from that health regulations you know i mean like you know a rice cooker and you know wraps there you go right i mean so yeah. Those kinds of things get bizarre sometimes. Now, are those enforceable? Like, are they grounds within, you know? And so it boils down to, is it disrupting the quiet enjoyment of the other tenant? And if so, then again, and, and here's the rub. Like I, And so coming full circle to how I started this piece, you can do it the right way or you can do it the real world way. And those might, some people might be raising their eyebrows now or whatever, but the real world way is this. The right way is, yes, file your paperwork accordingly. I think still think you have to be diligent and do that. Wait for your hearing. Spend your, I mean, uh, an eviction order now is, I think, uh, 175 bucks now or something like that. At the end of the day, you want to go meet with these people. You want to have candid conversations and you want to try to work something out. That's in COVID times and even in normal times. The last thing anybody wants, a landlord or a tenant, is to go to the tribunal. I can tell you, I've been there numerous times. It's not fun. It, it, it's it, The time that it takes, the effort that it takes, the money that it costs is not worth it in the end. Find a better way. Find a way to negotiate something with your tenant, especially now during COVID. At the end of the day, if it can't happen, it can't happen, and you got to go and do what you got to do. But... Um, that would be my biggest counsel. In fact, I wrote a note down here and I just want to make sure. Um, yeah, 
um, mutual consent. That's that's the note I wanted to write. I mean, today it's all about mutual consent, right? Getting rid of a tenant, uh, stopping them from doing something. It's about mutual consent. It's about negotiating something that's equitable for both parties um, that's going to benefit both parties, right? That's mm-hmm. that's. I know there's going to be people out there screaming and yelling, saying, "I don't mean, you know, you can't do that." Listen, we're living in a time now where, as much as the rules exist, they don't, and and you have to find ways to, to get th- through these situations, right? So, and and again, so and the other thing is, I, I mean, I don't want to end on a low note in terms of, hey, this is a negative thing. There's lots of landlords in the world. There's lots of rental properties, and lots of people that make excellent tenants and make excellent landlords. Those, there's there's horrible, land, there's bad landlords, there's bad tenants, there's great landlords, there's great tenants, right? So the goal of a property manager that, our do, that we do, and we qualify our landlords as well, as much as we qualify our tenants. Like, you know, we don't want landlords that don't care or respect their properties. I mean, the name proactive, I came up with because it's about being proactive in your, with your property, uh, with your tenant, uh, maintaining your property, all of that, right? You wanna you wanna take steps to avoid conflict and avoid problems, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I, yeah, you covered all the, the questions that I have written down for you. Yeah, I mean, and it, it, you know, there's a lot to cover. Uh, we've touched on some highlights. I hope it's helped people. Um, you know, a lot of this information is online. Um, certainly I'm always open and uh, willing to, to answer questions if anybody has them and wants to email or, or call in. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I don't have all the answers. Don't, don't miss, don't kid yourself. Right. I mean, even doing this for as long as I've done it, there's still situations that surprise me and frustrate me and, and all the rest of it. Right. So, but it's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta work through it. So. Yeah, and thank you very much, man. I appreciate you doing up the questions and uh, and taking part in the podcast. Yeah, so. Glad to be on. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone, and we'll talk to you on number fifteen. Mm-hmm.